get started. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, that'll do. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, very special RSS Merseyside local group event. So uh, if I can get my slides. There we go. Yes. Welcome to the RSS Merseyside local group. Uh, my name is Liam Briley, and I'm the chair of the Merseyside local group. Um, welcome, everybody, joining us in the room. And also uh, a big hello to those people joining us online. Um, welcome to this very special event in celebration of our home city, Liverpool, hosting the Eurovision Song Contest on behalf of Ukraine. And I cannot tell you how excited I am that we've got four amazing talks about Eurovision stats coming up. So uh, we'll have Adam Price talking about voting blocks and then Dr. Anna Alyanaki talking about uh, contest statistics over the years, sounds and lyrics and winners. And then we'll take a short break. Um, after that, we'll have Alan Wise talking about uh, finding sentiment through Eurovision lyrics. And finally, Dr. Andrew Gustar talking about patterns in Eurovision scoring. So I imagine um, there might be many people here who've, who've never heard of us before, whose, whose first event this is. We run all kinds of events on basically hot topics in data science and statistics. So we've got uh, upcoming events on AI and computer games in June. And we're also organizing a secret statistician event for October. So the idea behind this event is that um, it will show some career profiles where people use statistics where you might not necessarily expect it. So we, uh, we engage the local community with, with statistics across Merseyside. Um, if you want to keep in contact with us, we have our website, rss.org.uk forward slash Merseyside. We also have our Twitter, at RSS Merseyside. And of course, the YouTube channel where this event and all our other events are available to watch back. If you want to uh, find out about local stats events, not just from us, but also from other local institutions. We also have a newsletter that we put these in, and you can sign up to this through that website, at rss.org.uk. Um, just a couple of quick sort of RSS notes before we start. Um, registration for the annual conference is open. It's in Harrogate this year. Uh, there's discounted early bird registration until 5th of June. Uh, and also nominations for the 2023 William Guy Lecturer position is open. So this is a, an esteemed role for those passionate about talking about statistics to young people and schools. So this year they're looking for experts in climate change and environmental stats. Um, it's only open for another week. So if you want to make a nomination or apply yourself, you'll have to get in very quickly. But uh, if you've followed us for a while, you'll know that Dr. Laura Bonnet was a previous William Guy lecturer, and she gave a fantastic talk for us about risks of epilepsy seizures during driving quite a while back. Uh, and I do know we have a, a really wide audience today, particularly online. Uh, if you don't know who the Royal Statistical Society is, it, it probably conjures up images of rather old professors in a dusty room somewhere furiously working through equations. That is not what we're about at all. We are about any any kind of interest in data and how we use it to make the world a better place. So the RSS is a professional network for anyone interested in statistics, no matter what your career stage. We're also a charity that strives for better use of evidence in public decisions. And we've been involved in, for example, uh, the pandemic response. And the RSS has also given commentary on the uh, school grading algorithm when exams weren't allowed to take place. Uh, much more as well. Uh, you can find out about what we do on the website, where you can also get free e-membership if you are a teacher or a student. I think that's quite enough from me from now. So I'm going to pass over to Adam, who I'm hoping will be able to uh, share his talk for us. So Adam Price is an AI researcher with uh, data and computer science background. He holds an MSc in artificial intelligence and he works as a reinforcement learning engineer examining multi-agent systems, but he enjoys studying networks and statistics. And we're gonna hear about how he's applied this to Eurovision voting. So I'm gonna pass uh, the stage to you, Adam. All right, cheers. Uh, can you see, hear me all right? Can 
can hear me fine? Yeah, I think so. Real. Okay, I'll get started. So uh, my talk today is on identifying voting blocks in the Eurovision Televote. So I guess the first question is, are there voting blocks in the Eurovision? So I started looking to this topic uh, during the lockdown of uh, 2020, after a bit of a discussion on how political the Eurovision actually is. Uh, sort of common complaint, I think, especially about people in the UK is that we're just not very liked. And so there must be something more than just the songs going on in the actual voting. Um, it's also, you can see just watching the show that uh, neighbouring nations tend to have a slight bias towards each other uh, and other nations tend to perform consistently quite bad, thinking like uh, the UK, Germany. Um, however, the winner of the Eurovision does change every year, which means that this sort of whatever national cultural bias uh, can affect everything because you know the, the winner changes people like uh, nations go up and down so the songs must have some sort of effect uh, so in this talk I just want to see if there's any statistical basis for claims that there's bias in the Eurovision televote so a little uh, case study on just one nation so if we look at the UK before 2022 when our statistics got skewed a little bit when uh, Sam Ryder uh, had his song uh, before 2022 we'd um only received 84 points in all the televotes, uh, which is actually 99 fewer than Sam achieved in just one year last year. Um, but before that, our, our chief contributors were uh, Ireland, uh, Australia and Malta, uh, three nations that were quite clearly linked to, two of those being Commonwealth, uh, Ireland obviously being our neighbour. Uh, so 57 of those 84 points achieved by the UK between 2014 and, and 2021 came from, you know, what you could consider our, our friends. Um, now, this would be good evidence of some sort of political or cultural bias. If, however, in 2022, the UK hadn't come fifth in the televote, which I think shocked British statisticians and Eurovision fans uh, everywhere. So was this televote evidence against a political or cultural bias towards the UK? So just a little bit of background on, on how voting in the, in the Eurovision works. Uh, we have a jury and a televote. So those two separate rankings are combined to get the overall point total. The jury vote is a small committee that each um, nation has to rank the songs in order of quality. And the televote, which opens up to the whole population of the nation uh, to produce a separate ranking. Uh, and the results of this televote have been published since 2014. So we've got a fair bit of data to work with now. Um, for the sake of finding bias in the voting, I opted only to investigate this televote uh, on the logic that national bias would be averaged over far more people in, in a televote than in a jury vote. So, on finding bias, um, voting blocks, uh, I've defined a voting block as follows. It's a set of nations that rank each other disproportionately higher than average nations rank another average nation. Uh, finding proof of these blocks is quite difficult, as voting data in the Eurovision is rather noisy. After all, it is a song contest, uh, so the quality of each nation will vary from year to year, leading to quite noisy, noisy data. However, nations that have a strong bias for each other will overcome this noise over the course of multiple contests. Uh, when multiple nations share a mutual bias for each other, then a voting block is formed. So um, I managed to get all this Eurovision data into a spreadsheet and I, I made a few changes to it. So point values given to a nation have been normalized by the number of points that nation received each year. Uh, so instead we take out uh, the proportion of points given to each nation uh, and point values were adjusted slightly. So instead of the 10 and tw uh, sorry, 12 and 10 points uh, that are given to the first and second ranking, I changed those to uh, 10 and nine just to better reflect the rankings, not the actual points. Um, only data from the finals has been used, so I haven't looked at the semi-finals. And uh, nations who received no points in the finals they appeared in were removed from the pool. Um, bringing this together, we have the proportion of points that, that each nation gave to each other nation in the televote final. If you take the average of those proportions of each nation, uh, no, no, so then we get the average uh, of the proportion of each nation. And we can use this uh, resulting matrix to create a weighted bi-directional graph showing the uh, average proportion of points each nation gives to each other. Uh, using <clears throat> this resulting graph, we can look for clicks within the network and we can consider those clicks are voting blocks. 
So to find uh, these clicks, uh, I use something called the Luvian method. Uh, this is a community detection method that attempts to find uh, groups with strong connections within a network. Uh, the Luvian network starts by finding a small group of strongly collected nodes and then grouping them together. Uh, then an iterative process starts in which uh, nodes are added to those groups and then the new groups are grouped together and you keep doing this process until all nodes are in a community. If we then take the communities and we put them into this heat map, this heat map shows the proportion of points offered to each other's nation and we've grouped them by the communities and we can see uh, a few sort of uh, squares in this block from the grouping. Some are stronger than others. Obviously, the uh, top left one is the strongest with uh, some quite large and nebulous squares in the middle. Um, but And translating that to a map so we can see it a lot better, we get these blocks forming where we've put in every single nation. Um, we can see a particularly large uh, Northern European block, uh, Eastern uh, block as well is quite large. Uh, and these typically are just showing neighboring nations. Uh, and then you have some bizarre ones like uh, Iberia slash Germany and Switzerland. Um, because we forced every nation into a block, some of them aren't as strong as others, um, which leads to this idea of, of trying to remove nations that don't fit into a block. So removing asymmetrical nations. So at the heart of the definition I gave for a uh, voting block is a mutual sort of shared bias. Uh, to improve the blocks we find, we can remove asymmetrical nations. So a nation's asymmetry will tell us how reflective they are with the points they receive from a nation. Uh, if a nation had zero uh, asymmetry, it would imply that a nation gives back the same amount of points that it receives from a nation. Um, a nation with high asymmetry will be difficult to fit in a block as it's not returning the points that it's given. It's not showing that mutual bias. So if we take out a lot of these uh, as uh, asymmetric nations. This was a sort of arbitrary process of uh, just choosing a cutoff point on an asymmetry metric and, and just saying, we'll take those out of the pool. We get a new heat map that is slightly more defined and it uh, translates to this uh, map of Europe where the now vote blocks are, are in general a bit smaller and compact uh, and taking out a few nations. Um, one thing that I think is quite interesting about this, nations like France and Germany and the UK, uh, which are all nations uh, that get automatic promotion to the final, um, aren't in any of these blocks. Um, so this was all um, it, using information I gathered a few years back, back in 2020, um, to prove that there was some sort of base statistical bias. I decided to, for this talk, uh, update this using the new data. So we've had two Eurovisions since then, and the world has, has changed a fair bit. Uh, so recreating this map using new data um, we see a sort of shift in the voting blocks. Um, I think most notable among these is the inclusion of all of these sort of Mediterranean countries down in the South Europe and uh, the Ukraine moving voting block to, um, to Northern Europe. I think this was caused by the North Europe uh, block being the largest. And when Ukraine won last year, they did very well in the televote. And so they've moved over to the largest block. Um, so... I started looking at a new approach to this, not being 100% satisfied with the Luvian method. Um, so although these blocks look sensible, um, I wasn't happy that some of the uh, nations had to be removed by a sort of arbitrary process. And I also felt like the blocks were a little too large, 15 countries in that one um, Northern Europe block. It's just seemed far too many for a logical voting block. Uh, so I set out a new assumption for trying to find voting blocks. Uh, and that's nations that show voting bias for the same nations will be in the same block. So if you vote similarly to another nation, you're probably in a block together, is the assumption. So I came up with a procedure for turning these televotes into vectors. So instead of creating a bidirectional graph, we could imagine each nation's votes as a vector in a high dimensional space. Uh, this vector has equal length to the number of nations that receive points in. Uh, Euro Televote finals since uh, 2014, so that's 43 different nations, uh, and each, uh, each vector details the average number of points that uh, each nation gave to another nation. Um, this uh, is, is indexed by sort of alphabet, so you know uh, how many points every nation gave to Albania would be uh, index zero. Uh, at each nation's own index, 
the uh, average of the maximum points that a nation received each year is set. So this will move uh, each own nation closer to other nations that gave them points um, in this high dimensional space. So when we've got this vector space, we can now start thinking about visualizing it. So quite simple, we just project this uh, national televoting uh, dimensional space, four three dimensional space, uh, and we can just pick out the nations that are near each other to form our blocks. Unfortunately, 43 dimensional space is very difficult to visualize. So we have to use an algorithm to reduce this dimension, uh, dimensionality. Um, I use something called a, a T-SNE algorithm, which is a tool from unsupervised machine learning uh, that can do that for us. And when we visualize that, uh, we get this. So we can see nations have been spread out across this now 2D search space, um, clumping similar voting patterns together. Um, now we have our nice 2D projection. We can look at clustering algorithms. These would also work in the high dimensional space, but uh, it's harder to visualize. Um, the one I've chosen for this is something called DBS scan. Um, DBS scan is a soft clustering algorithm which produces clusters, uh, clusters based on the density of points in the data. Um, DBS scan is a soft clustering algorithm, so it won't put every single point in the data. Uh, it won't force them all into a cluster. So there'll be certain nations that are outside of these clusters. Uh, and it bases cluster boundaries based on uh, gaps between the data of uh, data density. So once we run DBS scan, we get a uh, we get our, the same plot, but now with colors. Uh, we can see the nations that DBS scan has decided to put together in this space. If we translate this to a map, we get this new map. Um, you see Portugal and Russia being the two, uh, two of the nations that are taken out. I also excluded any pairs of voting blocks because you need more than a pair for a voting block. So that was, uh, I think, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan were a pair. Um, I think Malta were in a pair with San Marino as well, something like that. Uh, they've been removed. They also, interestingly, uh, didn't give any, didn't give any, uh, each other any points. So they could be removed quite easily. Um, oh, and I should say, you, you, Romania here should be in the, the, the block with the Ukraine. I made a mistake on that one. Um, but yeah, so now to just do some quick analysis on these blocks. So are they valid blocks? So we know that the uh, average country gives the other average country uh, 2.46 points. Uh, so anything above that is a, is a valid proof of a voting block. So we can see that Lithuania, Belarus and Czechia weren't actually a voting block because they don't like each other, apparently. Uh, Australia, Germany, Netherlands, France, the same thing. Uh, but all the rest of them are now blocks increasing in strength, finally getting down to uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, Switzerland, Austria, Serbia, which seem to have quite a strong bias for each other. Uh, and interestingly, UK here, uh, in a block apparently with Norway and Ireland, um, it could be said that being in a large block is quite beneficial. Um, and so maybe that's why we don't always do so well. And uh, for projecting that onto a map uh, on my last slide, we, uh, we can see the voting blocks visualized. And I'll go to questions. Okay, fantastic. Uh, you caught me a little bit off guard there, Adam. I had to crawl over the seat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's a quick end. Um, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned the idea of kind of mutual kind of points given across each other, because I remember the, I think there was a contest hosted in Norway in the 90s when, when Sweden dialed in to give their votes. The Norwegian hosts explicitly told them, over the years, we've given you this many points, but you've only given us this many points. So uh, <laughs> we have all the remaining points that we're owed now, please. Um, I'm going to go to questions in the room, but I, I realize I should have said, if you are an online watcher and you want to ask a question, please do put it in the chat on YouTube. I believe you'll need to be logged into a Google or YouTube account to actually take part in that chat. But if you've got questions for any of our speakers, do just put them in there. But for now, I'm going to go to the room. Are there any questions for Adam? Yes, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to have to give you the microphone, I'm afraid. Thank you. I just wondered the you, the you, the song contest itself has its own pots of countries that it uses to um, to do various draws and allocations based on voting patterns. Was there any matching up with the, with that sort of data, or, or 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 have you perhaps identified anything new that they haven't noticed? Um, 
I haven't seen that data, so I don't know. Um, I'm happy to go look it up and uh, yeah, maybe follow up with that. But no, I, I'm not aware of that data, so so no. Cool. Do we have any other questions in the room for Adam? Yes, I'm going to come over to the back. Stepson. Have you compared the uh, the actual winners for from the uh, various competitions with the blocks to see if this actually ends up with certain blocks generating the winners? Um, I have, or at least I did with the older data, and the winners were jumping from block to block quite a lot. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think that's sort of Northern Europe block at the most. Um, it doesn't seem like the blocks are enough to push a nation to winning. Some nations seem to benefit from the more than others as well. So Italy always does quite well. Switzerland always does quite well. But it's hard to, obviously it's hard to tell if that's because the songs are good or, or if it's because there's some sort of bias. And obviously this bias can be for lots of reasons. You know, uh, Italian songs are probably liked by their neighbors more just because they sound better, like more familiar. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think the blocks are good enough to affect or, or large enough to affect who actually wins. Um, but they can seem to help with sort of consistent, strong performance for some nations. Cool. And I guess I've got a, a question of curiosity, I suppose. So if you, you've used the TS and EE and mm -hmm. scan to find the countries that are sort of close together. Can you also infer the opposite information? So sort of which countries are most... Which countries uh, dislike each other the most. Yeah, I guess. And which countries um, are adversaries in terms of voting, which countries don't like each other's songs. Yeah, I did briefly think about that. And you sort of end up with like a sort of data void where you just end up with nations that have never given each other points sort of exclusively. Uh, and, and finding pairs of that is quite simple, like uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan. And you can look at sort of asymmetry on a nation basis. Um, I think there's quite a funny one with Bulgaria and Belarus. And that's... Uh, Belarus seems to love Bulgaria, but Bulgaria has never given them a point. Um, it's just quite sad. Um, but yeah, in theory, you could reverse the logic and find uh, the opposite of voting blocks, yeah. Okay, and I'm just going to check, do we have any last questions online or in the room? There is a question online, okay. Uh, well, hello, um, I just thought, um, you know, some of these blocks don't seem based on geography, and I wondered if there was any reason for the... Um, the more unusual looking blocks, like um, you know, where you have Spain and Greece, Bulgaria, um, Belgium. You know, any Is there any possible underlying reason for those sorts of groupings? Yeah, so I think there could be some really interesting sort of sociology to look into on this. I don't have any big reasons for why something like Spain, Belgium, Bulgaria, Greece comes out. Um, other than it, it can be quite hard to fit some nations. Uh, a nation like Spain doesn't typically do too well, uh, so they never really fit in blocks. So this could just be, and it's a little bit lower average uh, point sharing than other nations. This could just be a bit of a coincidence um, with the data still being, even though we've had quite a few finals since 2014, uh, the data is still quite noisy because we only get data from every nation that's you know participating in the final. Only goes down to about 20 or so nations. So there's still a lot of a lot of noise in the data. It could just be that for this block, Spain decided to give Bulgaria a disproportionate amount of points because the public liked the song. You know, uh, it, it's hard to tell. Um, but no, I'd be interested to see if anyone wants to take this data and look into why some of these things might have happened. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot more that could be done here. Um, but I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker. So let's all thank Adam once again for a fantastic talk. Cheers all. Uh, and now, I suppose, in, in true Eurovision style, we are connecting up to another country. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Anna Alyanaki, who is joining from Estonia. Uh, Dr. Alyanaki is an assistant professor from the University of Tartu and a data scientist. So she conducts research in music generation and music similarity and is head of the computer, sorry, computational music analysis and recommendation research group. So if you are ready to share your slides, Anna, I will pass to you. Uh, okay, great. Uh, hello. <clears throat> Very interesting talk about uh, the voting patterns. 
uh, as a person from a Baltic country, I was surprised to see that Lithuania is like nowhere near us, Estonia and Latvia. But okay. Um, so uh, in my talk, I will be talking from a music information retrieval scientist's perspective about Eurovision. So uh, I will explain a little bit about what is music information retrieval. Mm, it's a branch of science which looks at music from uh, a perspective of uh, signal processing, um, sometimes natural language processing, and tries to um, understand um, or teach computers how to uh, understand music in the way that we humans do. And I like to talk about music information retrieval as a conversion between different formats. So, <clears throat> for instance, you have... <clears throat> <clears throat> a sound, excuse me, a sound recording, and you want to uh, transcribe it, uh, and you want to get like a sheet music recording out of that sound recording. That would be a transcription uh, between sound and symbolic, like a conversion between sound and symbolic format. But then, um, even something like genre classification uh, or um, automatic tagging can also be thought about as a conversion from the sound or from a symbolic format into. Um, these conceptual categories uh, about music or music generation could be thought of as a task of conversion uh, from like a natural language description of what we want to get. Maybe um, please compose a piece um, uh, played by violin influenced by Chopin and uh, uh, Kanye West uh, into sound format. Mm. Okay, so we are doing a lot of this uh, format conversions. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, uh, companies that you probably already know that are doing uh, MIR, uh, such as Spotify, which do mostly music recommendations, uh, Deezer, or such as MusiMap, which do all sorts of categorizing, Shazam, which does audio fingerprinting. Uh, okay, so how uh, does music information retrieval work? Uh, well, uh, we have a digital signal, and usually we uh, work from mm, this raw format by uh, learning some machine learning model that can, um, from a digital signal, learn uh, a mapping to maybe annotations, like mm, predict mood of music from, uh, from a signal, or um, maybe predict chords. <clears throat> Uh, sometimes um, other types of data are involved, uh, not just digital samples, but uh, uh, maybe lyrics, uh, singing data. And we can do some other type of analysis like uh, artist identifications or uh, analyze the formants in someone's voice. And uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, always the gener generative thing, the very hot right now. Uh, with uh, transformer models and stable diffusion models uh, breaking the ceiling of what was thought to be possible in uh, creative aspects uh, in generative music. Okay, so back to Eurovision Song Contest. So it's been running for 63 years, and um, the amount of songs in Eurovision Song Contest has been increasing over time. So here is a little histogram where you can see how many. Uh, songs there were in the beginning, and it was under 10 uh, in the competition, I think seven songs, and then uh, it's about five uh, constantly for uh, the last decade, 25 countries. Um, okay. So uh, the music that was played in Eurovision changed a lot, but of course the musical landscape has also changed a lot. Uh, here is the song that won first place in the first ever uh, Eurovision uh, festival, which was called uh, Le Grand Prix Revision de la Chanson Européenne. Um, and uh, a song from Switzerland, and it sounded like this. Refrain, du ciel, parfum de mes vingt ans. Uh, did I actually share the sound this time? Can you hear the sound? Uh, can you confirm, Liam, that there is sound? I don't know if you can hear me, but yes, we heard it. Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, okay, and this is Switzerland again, but it's in 2019 when it won fourth place, but it again performed very well. And it's what the Switzerland sounds in. Thank you. She made the party. Stop. She can't not it. Yeah. Dropping it, dropping it down. When she go low. So let's um, dive into how the musical characteristics of uh, this music uh, changed over time. And we can see, we will see that uh, how the music changed is sort of like a cultural um, footprint of what happened in music overall over this time. So what we will be doing, we will extract uh, some features from song audio, uh, features describing uh, timbre of music, like MFCCs and spectral shape and harmonicity, uh, features extract, uh, describing uh, rhythm, like BPM and onset rate, um, features uh, describing um, like processing characteristics, uh, the sound processing characteristics like uh, loudness, zero crossing rate, roughness, and harmonic features, uh, key chords, melody. And we will also extract uh, features with neural networks, which I'll, I will talk about later. And we will look at pictures like this. So, <clears throat> Uh, on these pictures, which we will be looking at uh, throughout this talk, we will see um, on the uh, X axis the years that Eurovision has been happening. And on the Y axis, we will be seeing um, <clears throat> the feature in question averaged over all the songs of that year. Um, and yeah, uh, extracted from, mm, from, from the songs of this year um, on such a scatter plot. So the first feature we will talk about is the um, uh, key um, or uh, specifically the mode uh, of the key. Um, there are two, major and minor mode. Um, and um, well, to those unfamiliar with music uh, theory, major mode is the like a cheerful and happy one. And um, it sounds like na 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 and minor mode uh, sounds like na 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 I don't know if you can hear the difference but well uh, minor mode is supposed to be sad and major mode is supposed to be happy <clears throat> and uh, to extract a key usually uh, we compute uh, a, like a heat map um, called chromogram and this heat map shows uh, us how much of every uh, possible of the 12 uh, pitch classes there are in uh, in a particular instant um, of music. And uh, by instant, I'm usually talking about uh, uh, like 200 uh, up to 500 millisecond windows. Mm, and then from a chromogram, uh, we can compute uh, which uh, tonality mm, we, we think uh, the music is in. And from a tonality, uh, there is an associated property of this mode. So we can see that um, the uh, proportion of songs in major mode um, has uh, fallen since um, uh, the disco period, uh, since the 80s, um, and is at, at an all-time low now. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, still, uh, most of the songs in Eurovision are actually in major mode. So. Um, then another thing we will look at uh, is um, uh, a proportion of uh, major chords. Uh, we extract uh, uh, chords, um, again, using uh, this uh, heat map called chromogram, um, using um, a model, um, like um, a sequence model, uh, to make sure that the, the crop transitions make sense. Mm, and uh, we again can see the same uh, trend as with major mode, uh, that the proportion of uh, uh, major chords uh, is falling. Um, so I have to clarify that um, there is not a, like one-on-one -on -one correspondence. So minor chords uh, can have, uh, minor uh, songs can have chords uh, in major. And sometimes in the minor song, um, there, there can be a lot of major chords. Uh, if uh, a lot of the chords are in, uh, 
in the tonality of the dominant of that minor. Well, anyway, but uh, we just confirm our finding that uh, the songs uh, keep getting um, gloomier. Uh, and then another um, even uh, more clear uh, picture of that is um, confirmed by using a neural network. So here, um, uh, it's, it's something I developed uh, to detect uh, majorness. So mm, major and minor uh, mode is, is like a, a binary classification problem usually. And the musicians think of major and minor mode as um, uh, two opposites. But in reality, in music, they don't have to really be opposite. And sometimes uh, there are ambiguous um, examples where it's difficult to understand whether it's a major or in minor mode. And so it's kind of um, skewing the statistics when you try to uh, frame this problem as binary while uh, there is actually a range. So here is uh, an example of what I mean. We will go from very major thing. Very major. This is slightly less major. Uh, something in blue scale, but uh, still majory. This is technically major, but it kind of starts uh, sounding minor. So um, a musician um, will tell you it's actually major. Uh, and this is an ambiguous one. So the chords uh, under this are major chords, uh, but the melody, uh, if you would have it stand alone, you would tell that it's minor. So there, there is a neural network that can recognize from such examples. Uh, there are more than nine. Uh, there are about 3,000 examples. Um, the majorness of the sound, and on this picture we can see in an even more uh, clear way that there is this very high peak of majorness in the 80s, and uh, right now uh, we are back to where we started. Okay. Um, yeah. So... Um, right, and this is how um, this training happened. There is a MEL spectrogram of 11 seconds of audio and uh, ground truths where uh, pieces are annotated on uh, seven different uh, properties like rhythmic complexity, majorness, and some others. And now we will look at these uh, properties annotated by a neural network like this. Mm. Okay, I'm not sure if, well, um, right. So here is some more examples of um, neural network learning uh, this mid-level uh, features, also used to study your vision on like rhythmic stability. On, on the left, you see an example of very low rhythmic stability. Uh, and you can see on a spectrogram that there are not so many vertical lines. So vertical lines on a spectrogram would mean beat. And horizontal lines on the spectrogram would mean uh, pitches, so uh, tonal pitches. And uh, as we move towards higher rhythmic stability, we have this uh, very um, regularly occurring, occurring uh, vertical lines, which are uh, apparently a drum. Mm. Uh, the more of those, the, the higher the rhythmic stability. So here are these interesting uh, properties, mid-level properties, as I call them, of music. So uh, melodiousness of the songs uh, was decreasing over time. Mm. Dissonance uh, increased for, uh, for some time until we reached a peak dissonance uh, in uh, 2010, and then uh, I guess people got tired of it, and dissonance is decreasing, then rhythmic stability has been increasing, and again, we have this um, 
peak uh, in dance uh, type of music somewhere in the 80s, 90s. And then it has been decreasing again. Uh, and then rhythmic complexity um, sort of increased and stayed there. And um, another interesting property is that music became more uh, atonal. So um, it used to be sort of more, more musical, um, which I guess makes sense because the more culturally uh, complicated things tend to sort of, well, produce more complicated music. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about lyrics a little bit. <clears throat> so my rough uh, estimate is that about 75% of songs on Eurovision are about love. Uh, and um, I calculated that by uh, looking for songs mentioning topics like uh, uh, kissing, holding hands, uh, loving uh, lovers, and uh, like concepts semantically similar to that. Uh, and uh, 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 precise statistics that I can give you is that 60% uh, of songs um, on Eurovision actually contain a uh, word love, but not all of them are about like romantic love. Mm, here is a word cloud of Eurovision uh, lyrics. You can see love here, uh, heart, um, and um, yeah, if you look close enough, you can see things like la 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 and um, other examples of. Um, Songlish language, ding ding, and so on. Uh, so um, I wanted to find out whether this love is a happy type of love or it's a sad, unrequited type of love. So I went to um, sentiment analysis and, um, well, what I did, I just uh, treated a song lyric as a paragraph that I ran through Google NLP like API, which gives you a sentiment value. The higher the sentiment value, uh, the more positive is the lyric, and it can also be negative. So uh, it is kind of on the lower side of positive, uh, but uh, it could also be negative, and it almost never was negative except in the like 80s and 90s in some years. So uh, overall, uh, the Eurovision song lyric sentiment is rather positive, but there is like a slight trend of decreasing this uh, positivity over the years. In uh, the 90s, in the 1999, uh, the rule that uh, Eurovision song has to be sung in uh, native language uh, has been relaxed. And uh, immediately we saw like uh, the proportion of songs uh, sung in English jump from one to seven. Uh, but still national languages are going pretty strong. So uh, there are a lot of... Um, uh, oh, no, it jumped from one to 16, actually. Oh, that's pretty sad. Uh, yes, but still there is a proportion of songs in national languages. There is the belief that if a song is in national languages, uh, it won't reach as far of an audience and, um, well, it won't get as many votes. So people try to uh, have their song in English. So let's look at whether it is true that a song in English always does better. So um, here is another statistic. Um, we uh, calculate how well the song did by using a percentile uh, in which it landed in the competition. So because there are always uh, a different amount of songs yeah, in a competition, so it could be like in, in the beginning it was seven songs and uh, in the end it could be 25 songs and then over the years some nations like don't participate, Australia comes, someone goes and then, uh, well, if you say 
the song got 15th place, it could mean very different things, depending on whether there were like 30 songs in the competition or there were 15. So we calculate the percentile um, of uh, how well the song did, and then uh, the higher the percentile, uh, the, closer, the closer the song was to winning. Uh, so actually, we don't see as much of a difference um, between a song being in English and a song being in the na uh, national language and uh, its performance. And uh, even the percentile of songs in English, like on average, is a little bit lower than a percentile uh, of a song in a national language. So it's not true. And uh, uh, don't get disheartened seeing in your tongue. Okay, another statistic on the lyrics uh, is um, the complexity of the lyrics. And we will compute um, how, um, how complex of a language or how complex of a lyric it is by using a very simple statistic, lempel uh compression. Uh, so it's um, a text compression algorithm. Uh, basically, the more of a repetition there is in the lyric, uh, the uh, higher will be, no, actually the lower, yes, the lower will be the compression ratio. So you can uh, compress it better if it's a repetitive song, which just says la, 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 a lot. Um, and you can see that over the years, um, the lyrics sort of become more repetitive. Uh, there are uh, uh, less unique words uh, per song. So in the beginning, there would be about uh, percentage of unique words would be about 34. And then uh, in the end, it's more like 20, um, about a quarter of this words uh, would be unique and the rest of them will repeat at some point. So. Um, we can say that lyrics are kind of becoming more repetitive and um, less complicated. Uh, there are certain countries uh, that um, do not follow this rule. So all the statistics are averaged over all countries of this year. And for instance, I can say that Italy um, has always uh, lyrics that are like, not very well compressible and a lot of unique uh, words. Um, mm, and if you look at Italy's lyrics, they always sing in their national language and their lyrics are very poetic in nature. They really have like this like uh, poems um, and uh, they never do this sort of dancey, um, cheerful uh, thing where the singer just uh, like doesn't really need lyrics to convey their message because the message is more uh, in um, music and dance and maybe the performance than it is in the lyrics. Yeah, for Italy, the message is almost always in the lyric. Um, uh, yeah, another thing uh, that we can look at uh, to predict whether the song will win or not is the order of the song in competition finals. Uh, so here we again look at the person, uh, the higher, uh, the better the song did. And we look where, um, uh, where was the song in the finals. So uh, did it get a slot in the beginning or it got a slot in the very end? And uh, here we can see a very clear trend. Uh, if you get a spot in the first five, um, you're lucky because uh, the further away, uh, the, the worse uh, will be the performance of your song. So um, uh, I guess it's explainable by the way uh, televoting works. Uh, so when televoting, you are uh, like, watching the songs, and when you like the song a lot, you can immediately um, vote. Uh, and um, yeah, the song in the beginning, people will just react to vote, and they have already voted. So uh, by the time they reach uh, the 20th song, well, they've already given their, their vote to someone else. 
Okay, and uh, at last, I also made a model to try to predict the winner from all uh, features. Um, and uh, the features uh, were about music, like musical properties, lyrical properties, um, a little bit about political history, so which bloke the country is in, uh, the order of performance. And um, yeah, the model didn't do well, so it covered about 10% of variants. And uh, some of the best features were actually uh, this, the order of the song in competition finals political features, and uh, as for the musical features, they were not uh, among the best features to predict uh, the winner. And uh, at last, uh, if you would like to try some uh, music information retrieval uh, yourself, uh, there are um, lots of libraries uh, for Python, and there are even uh, uh, like, mm, with a week, what you see is what you get. Um, libraries like Sonic Visualizer and Sonic Annotator, where you can extract uh, some of the properties that I was talking about, like chords and tempos, and, uh, some low level features uh, with one plugins. Um, yep, that will be all for uh, my talk, and um, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Hey, fantastic, Anna. Thank you very much. <clears throat> There's so many, so many things in there that, you know, to me, I'm not musically minded at all. So I would have never thought to kind of analyze these things about Eurovision songs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So do we have any questions for Anna in the room? Yes. Um, I'm going to see if I can tactically pass the microphone all the way back there. So I had um, just a question on the um, the national languages sort of bias towards um, performing in your own national language, giving you a slight edge over English. I was just wondering, was the research carried out before the rules changed, whereby a country used to be obligated to sing in its national language, but can now sing in any rule just because I think um, prior to the rule change, the majority of songs um, say only two countries will be singing in English, UK and Ireland. So that sort of skews the results towards national language songs performing better just because only two countries were singing in English. So was the research? Yeah, that's true. No, I just took the, the, the data from when the rule was changed. I actually didn't even look at. I, I don't even know like whether uh, whether UK had an advantage before uh, before the rule was changed. That's actually an interesting question because UK didn't do very well uh, since the rule was changed. So, yeah, not sure. Uh, and we've got another question in the room here. Let me come over there. Thank you. It's a, a question of fact. You, you, you mentioned about the uh, the songs that appear early on doing better. Um, I don't know, how do they determine the actual batting order for the uh, songs? Is it at random or is there a committee that chooses them? In which case, might there be bias in they select the best songs first um so there were different uh schemes of how this voting worked and which song would win but uh, the current scheme is that half of the points come from uh, like an expert uh, opinion expert committee and half of them come from televoting in some years it will just be the voting of the public that determined in some years i think they had only the committee um yeah, but uh, in this research, I use just the final result. So where the song uh, ended up in the um, in the final uh, voting, uh, I would take its place, uh, irregardless of uh, whether it was a committee, it was televoting or a combination. Do you, do you know anything, Anna, about how the how the actual running order is decided? You know, who decides which song? goes first oh How? yes yeah yeah that thing yes which song uh yeah uh, it's um it's just a fair draw or we are told that <laughs> that it's just uh yeah decided random I, I think i think my understanding is now <clears throat> there are some restrictions on it based on the kind of staging that acts want to do so if an act has very complex staging they might be specifically put between two acts that have very simple staging in order to sort of make the 
I suppose the logistics of the show easier. Um, and, and yeah, there's meant to be no bias in, in that selection, but of course, how can, how can yeah. you make an unbiased decision? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I've got one more question here. Yes. Thank you. It was very interesting to see, to be reminded of how different the Swiss entries were across the years. Um, I wondered, have you got any uh, uh, impression of how songs in the future might sound? And then the other, one other question, it was very interesting looking at the word cloud. Uh, it wasn't up for that long, but were there any surprising words that you saw in the word cloud? Well, let's look at it. Uh, yes, songs in the future. Um, actually, I have hopes that uh, with AI composing music, we can drive AI to sort of um, produce um, new music or help us explore into the unknown terrain because we don't really want AI to replace us or to hamper our creativity or sort of replace us in creative jobs and creative tasks that we enjoy. But maybe we can somehow um, drive it uh, or collaborate with it to uh, create music that is um, combinations that we haven't explored yet. So maybe maybe this is what music will be like. And about um, about the word cloud. Hmm. Unusual things. Well, uh, one unusual song that I know about for sure is a Belgium entry from 2004, which was in an imaginary language. So uh, that was unusual for sure. We, we are going to take a deep dive into lyrics and, and sentiment in, in one of our talks after the break. Um, I think for now, we've just got yes. time for one question. So I might just check if there's any questions online with Gareth. Okay, um, so yes, we have some good questions here. Um, could you use generative AI to make the ultimate Eurovision song based on your research on what is successful? <laughs> um, well, um, I guess um, AI definitely could make a song, but uh, there is already a competition for songs made by AI, uh, AI song contest. Mm, so. That's where it should go, I guess. I, I had no idea about that. Maybe we've found something for a, a future event topic here. <laughs> but for now, I think we should move on. So let's thank Anna once again for her talk and for joining us from Estonia. Thank you, bye. So for our online audience, we are now going to take a short break while we have um, some tea and coffee in the room. Um, we will return with our... Uh, remaining talks in around 10 to 15 minutes so um, please do not go anywhere this YouTube stream will keep running uh, and we'll see you very shortly
Okay, that should be us back. Welcome back to the second half of our event. Um, I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, Alan Wise. So Alan Wise is a data scientist working within cybersecurity with interests in interactive machine learning, but Eurovision is the only thing on his mind at this time of year, which is the absolute correct thing to say. Um, the first contest Alan can remember watching, which we talked about before actually, is uh, 2006, and he's been a Eurovision fan ever since he saw Lordy win with Hard Rock Hallelujah. Um, a very interesting song in terms of lyrics, and it's probably no coincidence then that Alan's going to tell us about sentiment analysis of Eurovision lyrics. So uh, I'm going to pass to you. I'll pass the mic that way and I'll get your slides up. Thank you. Be like Hi, everybody. Um, so Anna gave us a little taste of sentiment analysis before, but we're going to take a uh, deep dive into it now. Um, so first of all, I need to introduce sentiment analysis. Um, does this work, Liam? The... Yeah. Sorry, none of the technical issues. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Liam. Yes, so uh, sentiment analysis. Um, so it's a part of the NLP natural language processing family that gauges the emotional tone behind the body of text. Um, also known as opinion mining or sometimes known as emotion AI, um, used in a variety of different uses. So um, brand monitoring. So if you're part of a massive company, you might want to know whether people are praising you or slagging you off on Twitter. Um, reputation management, which is along the same lines. Um, something called voice of the customer analysis. So if you run a survey where people have to fill in answers, you instead of reading through maybe a thousand different surveys, you can run it through sentiment analysis and you can figure out whether the uh, opinions on these surveys are positive or negative. Uh, market research. And also me just investigating Eurovision lyrics. Um, I'm using a module called Vader, um, which makes a composite score that rates tax on a negative positive scale to negative one, uh, negative one to positive one. Um, so I've got three sort of examples here. Um, so when L uh, won in 2011 for Ed Spazan, he, he exclaimed, oh my gosh, I'm very happy. I'm the happiest man in the world. We'd hope that this would come through as positive. Um, so something more towards the one end of the scale. Uh, Terry Wogan, famous for his love-hate uh, view on Eurovision, says, um, I forgot which contest this is from, but he says, who knows what hellish future lies ahead? Actually, I do. I've seen the rehearsals. Uh, I personally think this is more negative, so we lean more towards the negative one. Um, Lasha Tumbai um, is a uh, nonsense saying, but actually it has a, a lot of controversy behind it because it sounds a little bit like Russia goodbye. Um, because this is nonsense and completely made up, it would, go, it would return a zero, so completely neutral. Um, so the module I'm using is called Vader. And now Vader was originally made for social media. So stuff that is about the length of a tweet. So I've got um, two people here. Liam has uh, thankfully given me his likeness for the Eurovision fan. And I don't want to accuse anybody of being a Brexit fan. So I used a GAN to generate a face. Um, Eurovision, Eurovision fan might say something like, "I um, the best time of the year is Eurovision. I love every single part of a contest. It's better than Christmas. Uh, whereas a Brexit fan who doesn't really understand Eurovision might say, we left the EU. Why are we still part of this rubbish contest? Our money is wasted on that farce of a show. Um, so I ran this through Vader. The Eurovision fan who has a positive view on Eurovision came back with a strong 0 0.9. And the Brexit fan who's got a more negative came back with a negative 0 0.7. Now, there's a little bit of a um, problem with um running sentiment analysis using vader is that it's primarily made for tweets if you run something like a full novel it normally comes back with either a negative one or one uh, whereas i think eurovision songs are a little bit more nuanced than that so um i took each line of the 
Uh, I've imputed the translated lyrics of Yuruhu's song. And I'll talk about how, why I use translated lyrics in a little bit. Um, for each line in the Eurovision song, I calculated the sentiment of the line using Vader, and my uh, output of the sentiment for the Eurovision song was the average sentiment of all lines in the song. Um, so handling different uh, languages is a bit difficult. Uh, thankfully, the data that I used um, has lyrics translations into English already in there. Um, but it just sort of comes with a caveat. So when I'm talking about these numbers, please uh, be aware that the accuracy of this tool is therefore reliant on both the sentiment analysis tool, but also the translation tool. Oh, I'll go back to the examples here. Um, so this is Gemini, not the 2003 Gemini that the UK bought. This is one from Portugal, and we're going to meet them a little bit later on. Um, they have this lovely song about flying a kite. Um, but unfortunately, the sort of beat at the start, they repeat the phrase die like do quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, this gets translated to die li do. Now, die is unfortunately uh, a negative sentiment. So this um, gets brought back down towards negative one. Um, Anna mentioned this as well. Um, this is Belgium uh, 2003, 2004, um, sung in a completely imaginary language. Um, <laughs> quote Terry Wogan again I don't I promise I don't quote Terry Wogan all the time um but in quote Terry Wogan he said that Belgium has um four languages and have decided this year to sing an imaginary one um so this imaginary language song would score a zero in their data set and I knew you, you guys were worried there was a song last last year in Latin uh, which is constructors in Corporsano um, we got a translation for that, and the sentiment is 0 0.217. Um, so I run the stuff through the sentiment analysis, and this is what the sort of histogram came back as. Uh, it it's reflects what Anna was saying, that sort of the mass of the data is positive, um, but we do sort of have these details, and a lot of songs do go on to the negative part as well. Uh, I've got a few examples of different Eurovision songs that I have looked at. Um, first is Congratulations, and I'm not talking about the Cliff Richard one. This is um, Sylvia Knight, which represented Iceland in 2006. Um, I just wanted to put on the record that I think she's an icon. She um, this song, she was basically congratulating herself. Um, at one point, um, she picks up a telephone and calls God in the middle of the song, which is completely bizarre. Um, she is a brilliant uh, piece to deep dive into if you're into all that. Um, through a special request, this wasn't on the original data set, but I stuck a love, love, peace, peace through there and is also on the sort of positive end of the scale. Um, Euphoria, um, which is personally, because uh, I guess I'm a bit basic, is my favorite Eurovision song of all time. Um, that comes in at about 0 0.206. Um, Hard Rock Hallelujah, which Liam mentioned, was one of the very first songs that allowed me to fall in love with a contest. It's just a bit below that. Um, Dancing Lash at Umbai, um, this, you know, it's not surprising for me that this is the second time early on in this presentation that Berkus or Dushka has appeared. Um, Gina G's Ooh Ah Just a Little Bit comes almost towards the neutral end of the scale, or close to zero. And um, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, but this is Iceland's 2019 entry, which, if you remember, was completely uh, a bit hard. Um, this came through about a negative 0 0.1, so on the negative end of the scale. Um, so uh, I need to take my notebook, actually. Um, this part actually has some very niche Eurovision songs, so I need to refer to my notes because I don't remember this that much. Um, I think when we're looking at these sort of things, the tales are really actually quite interesting. Um, so I've, I'm going to talk briefly about the top five positive songs, but also the top five negative. Um, first of all, uh, the top spot was uh, Conchita Bautista with um, what I named this presentation as Quebrano, Quebrano, which uh, translates to how good, how good. 
Um, it was her second attempt at a competition, and uh, you might have noticed I've been sprinkling Eurovision facts throughout this presentation. Um, if you know anybody who was part of the juries in 1965, it's shocking that she only receives zero points because she, I swear it's one of the best performances I've ever seen. Um, next is uh, Samia Yankee. Uh, apologies if I mess up any pronunciations during this talk. Uh, she represented Turkey uh, for the very first time. Um, and the song translates to A Minute With You. Um, next, Udu uh, Jurgens, which is actually a winner of Eurovision. Um, Austria has pr um, produced two winners of Eurovision. The one you might know more is Conchita Verst. Uh, Udo Jurgens was the uh, very first one back in 1966. Um, now, for Unfortunately for Udo, though, uh, this song is about a breakup, um, which you might think, okay, that's not very positive, but instead he's dealing with it quite well, where he spends the entire song thanking his former partner on um, how many good times they had together. Um, the next one is uh, Bob Benny, um, who represented all the way back, Belgium, all the way back in 1959. He came sixth. Um, he, it translates to love me as much, where he, singer basically repeats this phrase over and over again and uses um, metaphors sort of like, love me as much as stars love darkness. Um, and the only entry here from the last um, 48 years or so was um, Sophie Marinova's Love Unlimited. Um, so he, she, talks essentially about how love is unlimited and she um yeah so she says how love is unlimited and it has no language and color boundaries i'm just going to get my water briefly <laughs> so uh negative so first of all we've got um universo by blast Canto, and um, this is part of the cancelled competition. Um, Spain has the um, honor of being top of this data set, but also the bottom, um, which I think was cool. Uh, Gemini, um, Dile Du, which was unfortunately translated wrong. So this came in as the second most negative. Uh, I don't personally think it was fair because the song is about flying a kite and, and it's quite upbeat. Um, now, Natalia Podolaskaya song, I would say, has the quite most serious uh, subject matter. It's about a real tragedy in Russia. Um, so it actually firmly belongs in the spot. Um, Heart to Heart, which was Iceland's entry in 1992, um, translates to no or yes. Uh, this is a case where the lyrics don't really match the tune. So the lyrics are actually quite negative, but the tune is actually really bouncy. And um, Gary O'Shaughnessy's Without Your Love um, is quite a soppy song from Ireland back in 2001. Um, so looking at trends, um, this sort of echoes Anna's uh, talk as well. Um, so we see at the start, um, so these are sort of like 95 confidence intervals. Um, so the first three decades of Eurovision, songs are fairly positive. And then sort of like the next 20 years, the 80s and 90s, it goes down a bit. The, the 2000s and the 2010s goes down a bit more. And what we found very interesting so far this decade is that we've gone significantly lower. Now you can start sort of making up stories about this if you want. Uh, my story is that people are a bit annoyed with the COVID pandemic. People are feeling a bit downer in general. Um, another reason might be that the genres within Eurovision have changed quite a lot. So you have that there might be more rock songs rather than pop songs and rock songs typically have uh, more negative sentiments within them. Um, let's have a little look at winning songs as well. Um, so the most positive we've met him before is you do Jurgens with Mercy Cherry. Um, most negative is uh, Johnny Logan with What's Another Year. 
Um, only a few uh, negative songs, more so in the later competitions compared to the earlier ones. Um, only a few are actually completely negative. Um, I just thought uh, this is Milk and Honey's Hallelujah, which is the second most positive song. Uh, I thought I'd mention this one because this is one you might recognize from a recent contest back in 2019, which was part of an interval act. Um, the most positive um, from 2000s and above is uh, the Olsen Burroughs Fly on the Wings of Love, which might actually be more recognizable for people in the UK because it's used in a dance track by, I think, the artist was like DJ Sammy or something. Um, and the most negative uh, after the year 2000 was Emily DeForest's only teardrops. Um, so yeah, what I thought would be really nice is that we've maybe tried to use sentiment analysis to pick a winner. Um, we've seen lots of good different um, sort of methods to do prediction. I thought I'd just keep it really simple and do a regression. Um, so I thought it looked slightly like a quadratical. So that's what I tried to fit. I tr tried uh, both linear and quadratic and the quadratic actually fit a tiny bit better. Um, so the prediction was that the 2013 winner will have a sentiment of about 0 0.067 with a 95 prediction interval of negative 0 0.2 to about 0 0.34. Now, on the next slide, I wanted to sort of talk about which songs fit in this prediction interval and which songs went out with this interval. Um, but what I found was that, um, in fact, all songs fit within this interval. So therefore, I predicted the winner. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look at it sort of distance-wise. Um, so the closest to 0 0.067 is Slovenia's entry and Romania's entry. Uh, now, if you're looking at the betting odds, these are quite low down. Um, you'd make a lot of money if you bet on these, so <laughs> maybe don't. Um, the next one is Voyager Promise. Um, I personally think this will probably qualify, but winning is a bit more of a stretch. Um, the next one, though, uh, is Finland's entry, which is actually one of the favorites. Um, so I would say I'd be the most successful at my prediction if Finland wins. Um, also, the next one closer is Belgium's entry. Um, if you're wondering where the UK entry is, it's sort of within this sort of mix here, maybe a little bit further down. Um, I also thought I'd look at the favorites so far as well. Um, so at the top of the betting odds at the moment is Lorraine, who's coming back again with her song Tattoo. Um, if I would get a chance if you would try to look at her national final performances because she essentially performs in a massive Pedini press between two LED screens. It's amazing. Um, I think it's maybe not up there in the betting odds, but I think it's a dark horse. This is France's entry, which is quite a bit further away. Um, Thea and Selena, who the hell is Edgar, is a uh, Austria's entry, and this is also quite a strong one in the betting odds. And looking at sort of the extremes of both of them, uh, we've got um, Georgia's entry. Um, so this would be on one end doing the worst. On the other end, we have the <laughs> theatrical um, Croatian entry, Let's Free Mama Shti, um, which will be very provocative. And if they win, I've done the worst possible because uh, it's furthest away from my uh, prediction. So um, that's my talk basically done. I uh, just want to do some acknowledgements. So uh, thanks to Liam and our SS Merge site for inviting me along. Uh, I love this competition, so I, I really like to do this chance to talk about it uh, in this format. Uh, also, thanks to Liam for letting me to use his photo. Um, so there's a few um, sort of sources here. Um, so we have sort of the data set on Kaggle is very detailed. Um, so if you want to look at any data concerning Eurovision, I would recommend that's probably the place to start. Um, this work was based on a blog post and, and his associated code. And I thought 
um, this podcast, which fortunately has not had a new episode uh, since 2021, but because it's about Eurovision history, it's sort of timeless. Um, I also want to thank my partner, Rachel, because um, I'm not like this just now. I talk about Eurovision a lot and she has to listen to it. So uh, thank you. Uh, I used a lot of pictures during this as well, so I thought I'd uh, put the credits in there before, I don't know, at least stop me for copyright or something. And yeah, questions. <laughs> Yeah, I was very happy for you to use my picture. I didn't know you uh, you found my Twitter. I love Eurovision one two three four five. That's impressive. Um, do we have questions in the room for Alan? Yes. Hey, thanks. That talk was uh, really good, and I was also um, converted to Eurovision by Hard Rock. Um, hallelujah. Um, I think if if I remember correctly, you said with the sentiment analysis of each line, you then averaged the all across the songs. Do, do you know whether there were any songs that had maybe some very negative and some very positive sentiments and therefore averaged out at somewhere near near zero and therefore maybe maybe for those particular ones average might not have been the best um the best measure yeah so the easy answer is no <laughs> um but I, I I mean it's completely up to interpretation and Absolutely, this is something you could consider. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions in the room? I'm going to go to the back. Thanks. It's, it's a fairly similar question. It's just about Waterloo. Um, what score might it have got? Because it's about being very, very positive about being negative, if you see what I mean. I feel like I win when I lose and stuff like that. Yeah, you won't believe this, but I didn't actually look up Waterloo. <laughs> um, I I would expect it to be negative, but that's just me guessing at this point. Uh, and uh, yeah, one more question here. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, could you talk about the uh, model that was the the underlying model that was trained on Twitter data? I think you said. Um, where's that model come from? What kind of data was it trained on? So that's about as much as I can tell you. It was it's trained on primarily Twitter data. Um, it was used in the this blog post here for um, lyrics. So that's why I thought it might be the best bit. But as you said, um, Anna used a different model for sentiments, but came back with a similar result that, you know, sentiment is going down over time. Uh, I wrote a similar blog post about two years ago and decided to move to this model instead, uh, and the results were the same. Um, so overall, you might see that um, songs move up and down in the rankings on how sentiment is, but the trends you see say roughly the same. Does that make sense? Cool. Just to make sure there's no questions online. No. Okay. I think we'll move on to our final speaker then, but let's thank Alan once again. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Andrew Gustar. He is an independent researcher and a visiting fellow with the music department of the Open University. His PhD thesis was on the use of statistics to study music history. And he's watched many Eurovision finals and has never unfortunately come close to picking the winner. He has written a, a couple of articles about Eurovision on his website, and he also has an article in it, uh, sorry, about Eurovision in this month's Significance magazine from the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, but he's going to talk about the joys of Eurovision scoring. Thanks, Liam. Thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Liam said, my peculiar niche in academia is using statistics to study the history of music. 
Um, it's a niche of approximately one. Um, but um, I've been interested in Eurovision for a while because um, it's a very good source of statistics. And that's one of the reasons why I've called it the joys of Eurovision scoring, because the Eurovision website, I'll show you in a minute, has got loads of statistics on and they're all easy to scrape and nicely formatted and you can use them for all sorts of things. Um, it's also the joy of Eurovision scoring because I think it's quite a clever scoring system. Uh, this is the system that's been in use for the last six contests since 2016. Um, and we'll come into some of the details as to what, what makes that a clever scoring system. Um, and also, as I touched on at the end, I think it says something interesting about Europeans and the Eurovision family and how we relate to each other. Uh, but more of that later on. So what I'd like to cover today, three topics sort of quickly. Um, one of them is what we can learn about from the scores of the individual jury members. Uh, secondly, why the public televote will always have much more influence than the jury scores. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to return to the question that Adam started with at the beginning of this afternoon um, and look at voting clusters. Um, and hopefully we've got vaguely similar answers on that. But um, So first of all, let's have a look at some of the system work. Yeah. Which one are you using? I mean, down arrow, up arrow? Yeah. Oh, um, so this is an example of the page from last year, uh, how the UK voted. Every country has got a page like this. Every song has got a page a bit like this for all competitions, all semi-finals going back donkey's years. Um, so firstly, um, each country awards two separate sets of points in Eurovision. There's a jury of five prominent individuals from the music business, so we're told each of whom has the job of ranking all of the songs from first to last. These rankings are combined into an overall jury ranking there, um, and those are then converted into points. So 12 points are awarded for the first place song, 10 for second, then eight, seven, six, five, four, down for the rest of the top 10. Completely separately, each country runs a televote where members of the public can vote for their favorite song. Um, again, we get the full rankings of the televote and the points allocated in the same way as with the juries. Uh, this year, I'll just mention we've got 26 songs in the final singing. Uh, 37 countries will be voting. That's all members that take part in the semi-final and the final. Um, and we've also got an extra set of televote points this year, which I'll say a bit more about later. Um, and the golden rule of Eurovision is that nobody can vote for their own song. Um, what makes the... Um, uh, the contest exciting, one of the things, is that after all the songs are performed and the votes have been counted, each jury announces its points one by one, and then in ascending order of the jury totals, each song's total televote points are revealed. Um, and this almost always produces quite dramatic changes in the um, running order as the final few um, songs are announced. So um, let's start by looking at the individual jury members. We can think of these as a sample of 200 or so random permutations of the songs. Um, and we can use them to well, do all sorts of things with them. One thing we can do with them is to calculate the chance of a juror preferring one song over another. This is the results from last year, um, where the colours show the proportion of jurors who rank <laughs> song one on the x-axis higher than song two on the y-axis. So, for example, uh, down in the bottom right there, which you picked entirely at random, over 90% of jurors uh, preferred the UK song to the one from France. Um, however, in, much, in most cases, it was much closer, as you can see by the much paler shading, especially close to the diagonal. Um, you can spend a lot of time worrying about the details of that sort of chart, but in some ways, the most interesting thing about it is that it's possible to arrange the songs like this with all of the blues on one side and all the reds on the other side of the diagonal. By no means obvious that that should be possible. Um, and that suggests to me that there is perhaps a simpler underlying model. Turns out that something, something called a placket loose model fits this data reasonably well. Um, a placket loose model is a model of random permutations where the songs are assigned weights that are proportional to their chance of being preferred over each other. 
Um, and if we fit a placket loose model to this data, we get the weights shown here along the diagonal. Obviously, they can scale up, up and up and down arbitrarily because they only ever appear as ratios. Um, so, for example, the chance of a juror preferring the UK song to the Swedish song on this model is 100 over 192, which is about 52%, so quite close. Um, UK versus France would be 100 over 112, which is the 90% that we got earlier. Um, you can see that these weights don't increase in the same order as the songs. Uh, as you go up the diagonal, there's a slightly wiggly line. That's because they're the method for estimating the weights allows for the size of the preferences as well as the direction of them. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that each of the estimated weights is subject to a standard error of about 8%. So that was last year's data. Um, let's look at the placket loose weights of the last few Eurovision finals and see what uh, that can tell us. So these are all the finals under the current scoring system since 2016. Um, and what I've done is I've calculated the weights, put them in descending order, normalize them to add up to one, and then put them on a, plotted them on a logarithmic y-axis. And you can see that along much of the range, they roughly follow a straight line. Uh, these blue lines have been fitted between the fifth and the 20th values. Um, and typically they represent about a five to 6% change for each, for each place in the ranking. Um, five to 6% is of course less than one standard error in these weights, which means that we can't be very confident about the exact order of these sums. Um, and the 8% is the one and two standard errors of the blue shading either side of the trend lines. However, um, amongst the best and the worst songs, there seems to be a bit more agreement. Those weights could have flattened off at the ends, or they could have continued along the straight line, but actually they get more extreme. Um, the favourite songs rise above it on the left there, and the least popular one, shall we say, rise <laughs> all below it on the right. So I think that tells us that the jurors are more likely to agree on which are the best and worst songs than they are about the exact order of the ones in the middle of the pack. That feels right. I think that's we'd all recognize that when we come to judge new songs we haven't heard before. So this next slide shows how those preferences, which are still on the y-axis, translated into jury total points along the x-axis. And as you'd expect, there's pretty good correlation, by no means perfect correlation, but um, if there's a clear favorite, like Australia in 2016 or Portugal the following year, that will probably translate into a winning winning score, winning jury score at least. Um, but there are several cases where the leaders' weights and the points are in the, the wrong order. Um, and there's always an awful lot of variation further down the, the rankings. That's all I'm going to say about the juror scores. But um, they do seem to roughly follow a simple statistical model, which is reassuring. But I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that Eurovision scoring is quite that straightforward, as you will all know. Um, the jury scores are only half the story, and we have to consider the public televotes. So this next chart plots the total score from the juries still along the x-axis with the total score from the public televote now on the y-axis. Um, and the diagonals, the sloping lines there, are lines of constant total score. So to win the competition, you have to get furthest up towards the right -hand, top right-hand corner of the chart. First thing you notice here is that there's not much correlation at all between the juries and the public. Uh, there's always a lot of disagreement between them. In fact, only once in the last six contests have the juries and the public agreed on the winner. And that was um, this chap Salvador Sobral when he won for Portugal in 2017, with what remains the highest ever total score. Otherwise, twice in 2016 and 2019, the winner was neither the juries nor the public favourite. And three times, the televote has overturned the jury's verdict, including last year when an enormous wave of public support catapulted Ukraine into first place. You can also see that apart from the borderline case of Portugal in uh, 2017, the winner has always fallen above the dotted diagonal line, i.e. they've received more televote points than jury points. And there are more songs with no points from the public than there are that get nothing from the juries. 
So just to summarize that, because that's sort of covered down. The televote clearly has more weight than the public, than the jury's jury vote. Only once in the current system have the juries called the winner, and that was when the public agreed with them. Otherwise, the public has always overturned the jury's preference and has usually got its own way. Why, I hear you cry, what should that be? Um, well, it's largely due to the voting system itself, um, which we can see if we run some computer simulations. Um, so let's imagine a hypothetical voting country where the public and the jurors all rank the songs according to a typical placket loose model. Um, all got the same, same preferences. Uh, and we'll run 100,000 simulations and see how the points fall. The easy one, the televote, all the public has to do is vote for their favourite song. They don't have to worry about who's second or 15th or last, they just have to vote for their favourite. So with thousands or millions of televoters in a country, the points will almost certainly just follow the order of those placket loose weights. So the song with the highest weight will get the most votes and 12 points, second one will get 10 and so on. And songs that aren't, haven't got one of the top 10 weights will get nothing. For juries, the situation is quite different. Firstly, two reasons, the jurors don't just pick a favorite. They have to rank all the songs from first to last. And secondly, there are just five of them compared to hundreds of thousands of public televoters. So there will inevitably be a lot of random variation between them. So as a result, as shown by those red bars, the jury points are much more spread out. Now that is the contour line that just shows I know how to do contour lines on the chart really. But um, So song one only gets 12 points from the jury, about 27% of the simulations. Um, there's about a 6% chance of it getting no points at all from the jury. And there's obviously quite a good chance of songs with quite low weights picking up a few jury points. So even if the jurors and the public all follow the same preference model, it's very likely they will disagree quite substantially, as indeed they do. Um, moreover, across 40 or so voting countries, the televote points will tend to be more concentrated on a smaller number of songs compared to those from the juries. And that's why the public usually gives more points to its winner than the juries do to theirs. Why more songs get nothing from the public than get no point from the juries. And why there are often dramatic changes in the leaderboard. That's the last few results of our review. Um, I'd now like to turn to stick on the public televotes and come back to what we started with this afternoon, which is the issue of the extent to which countries vote in similar ways. Um, and I've taken a very different approach from um, Adam, um, but we've got sort of similar conclusions. So it'll be interesting to see what you think of uh, um, what we've got, the, how we interpret them as well, I think. Um, but if we take all of the televote rankings since 2016 and just calculate the correlation uh, between each pair of voting countries, we can use hierarchical clustering to see which countries tend to vote in similar ways as we've got here. Um, so countries whose televotes are most closely correlated are grouped together and where their lines join shows the correlation between them with perfect correlation of one on the left. So for example, the UK and Irish public tend to vote quite similarly. They're strongly correlated. Uh, in fact, the correlation is almost 90%, I think it's about 0.89 in my check. We can get um, clusters by cutting vertically through those branches of that tree. Uh, obviously, we could do that anywhere, but I've chosen to do it at the two dotted lines shown. Um, the one on the right produces three large clusters um, that are largely uncorrelated with each other. This is the zero correlation here, so none of those big chunks are particularly correlated with each other. Um, and they're shaded red, blue, and green on the left. Yeah, country names. The left hand cut is at about 0.6 um, and it produces nine small clusters which are shown by the brighter colors to the right of the country names. So the bottom green cluster, um, it's one that Adam also identified, is the six Balkan countries that used to be Yugoslavia. Um, their publics vote quite similarly to each other but quite differently from everyone else. Uh, in the middle we've got a blue cluster that's mainly Eastern European countries which splits into three smaller clusters. 
Um, and everyone else, Western Europe, Scandinavia, some Mediterranean countries and all of the island nations are in the top cluster in red, which splits into five small clusters. Um, note, we also, we've heard something special about Italy already. Uh, note that Italy is the only country in a small cluster of one, as it's the least correlated with anyone else. Um, so Italians uh, seem to be the most independently minded in their musical tastes, at least when it comes to Eurovision. Um, we can also show these clusters on a map. And other than a geographical map, I thought a hex map was more appropriate as all Eurovision countries are equal, irrespective of area or population, um, although it does mess up some of the borders, as anyone who's tried to compare one will know. Um, but we can see that the clusters are on the whole geographically close to each other. Um, San Marino is the only one that seems a bit out of place. Off, uh, doesn't really hang off the bottom of Italy, but that's as near as I could get it. Uh, but they obviously share their neighbour Italy's independence of musical taste. Um, the hole in the middle of the blue cluster um, yeah. is Slovakia, which uh, hasn't taken part in Eurovision since 2012. So let's look at our cluster. The UK and Ireland are both in the largest of those small clusters in dark orange there with the island nations of Iceland, Australia, and Malta, plus most of Scandinavia. Um, and these are the countries that seem to most closely share our musical tastes when it comes to music, to Eurovision. Um, just while we've got this up, the seven countries in brackets there are not taking part this year for various reasons. And up here in the north, we've got the mysterious rest of the world televote constituency, which is an innovation for this year. Um, completely unknown quite what that will do. Uh, very interesting to see who from the rest of the world chooses to vote in the Eurovision Song Contest. I don't think they've finalized the details as to who's allowed to vote yet, but um, we'll be hearing more about that over the next couple of weeks. And particularly interesting to see where their votes go. But by adding to the total number of, of available televote points, it will further increase the power of the public relative to the juries. That's certain. Um, so having identified these clusters, it's interesting to look at where their votes go. Um, and one way to visualize this is to identify each country's favorite, i.e. whose songs do they score most generously compared to other countries? So, for example, if you look at the rankings given by Australian televoters compared to the average rankings given by other countries, you find that it's Malta's songs that tend to receive the biggest uplift from Australia. So Malta, on this definition, is Australia's favourite. And you can see that for each, for each country. Um, it's a bit hard to see what's going on there. I apologise for that. Um, so let's rearrange that data into the clusters that we had before. So that's the same clusters that we had on the dendrogram. Um, and we've got countries on the left and their favourites on the right. The numbers on the far right here, which might be too small to see, just show how many times each country is a favourite. Uh, those with a dash have only performed once in the last six finals, so I've excluded them from the analysis. Uh, but also you'll notice that Bosnia and Herzegovina hasn't been given a favourite because, so, because it's only voted once in the last six contests. But everyone, everyone else, you know, there are some combinations that don't quite work, but everyone else is eligible to be either a favourite or to have one. Um, clearly, from this, most countries have favourites that are in the same large cluster as themselves, often in the same small cluster too. Um, remember that those original clusters were based only on correlation between televoting patterns. So it's interesting that in most, in most cases, a country's favourite happens to be in the same cluster. Um, what that says, I think, is that we seem to be most generous to songs from countries who vote like us and who therefore have similar musical tastes. Um, and I suppose that makes sense as countries presumably like their own songs that they send to represent them at Eurovision. So other countries that vote in a similar way ought to like them too. Um, the cluster the UK is in, the second one down there, seems to be a bit unusual on this chart in that apart from Sweden and Malta, um, there's a conspicuously large gap on the favorites side. Uh, we're not really anybody's favourite. 
Um, the other thing that's interesting about our cluster is that four of the countries with cross cu cross cluster favourites um, are in our cluster. So the UK, Ireland, Norway, and Sweden all have favourites in the blue cluster, even though most people have most countries have favourites in their own cluster. Our cluster's soft spot for Eastern Europe is partly explained by this next chart. Well, the dark lines now show the favourites that correspond to one of the top three foreign populations living in the voting country. So the UK, for example, uh, our favourite is Poland. Um, and it's surely no coincidence that the Poles are the UK's largest community of foreign nationals, especially amongst Eurovision countries. Um, so they, together with the Albanian population in Italy, the French living in Israel, the Lithuanians in Ireland, and many others, seem to be taking advantage of the ability to vote for their own songs. And frankly, who can blame them? Um, and on the basis of this, um, coming back to the rest of the world um, vote this year, it seems quite possible that the rest of the world televote points might well go to the countries with the largest expat populations living outside the Eurovision zone. Um, and the research I managed to dig up shows that the top ones of those are Germany, the UK, Ukraine and Poland. Um, and then you know, there's a, a longer list that could do well out of that, but it could be good news the rest of the world, but we will see. Coming back to this, if you didn't know that this was a map of Eurovision voting clusters, you might think it represented some sort of grouping based on countries' political history since the Second World War or perhaps it's a map of language families or cultural links, social connections and that sort of thing. Um, or alternatively with my musicologist's hat on, um, this could easily be some sort of classification of style in 19th century classical music or indeed in traditional folk music, uh, something which is often reflected in Eurovision songs. Um, as Adam alluded to earlier, these voting blocks have often been seen negatively uh, almost as if it's some grand conspiracy designed to frustrate the ideals of Eurovision. Um, and various changes to the voting system over the years, including the most recent one, have been designed at least in part to try and alleviate them um, without a great deal of success, it has to be said. Um, although the televote favourites are clearly influenced by the ability of foreign nationals to vote for their own songs, these clusters are based on a deeper correlation uh, it's not just the favourites, it's, it's the full ranking that the correlation contributes to these, uh, these clusters. Um, and that surely represents a range of musical styles and musical tastes, which in turn reflects the diversity of people, traditions, languages, cultures that make up the Eurovision family. So hopefully I've persuaded you that there is indeed some joy in Eurovision scoring, um, that it's quite a clever system. Um, that it says something interesting about you know, the Eurovision countries and how they relate to each other. Um, and that it's a great way of keeping the statistician quiet for hours on end. Um, but whatever happens this year, I'm sure Liverpool will put on a fantastic show. Certainly looked as if it was gearing up for it this morning. Um, and of course, we can look forward to another year's worth of exciting statistics to analyze next year. And if you're interested, um, I think that page is now live with a transcript. Any questions? Very well. Oh yeah. Thank you for that, Andrew. A uh, a really clear explanation of that phenomenon that maybe many of us have experienced when we watch the votes coming in from the juries and we go, ah, what? That's it's not it's not what I thought at all. Um, I'm going to see if there's any questions in the room. Yes. Hi. Thanks very much. Really interesting, particularly about um your final comments about how the um, new scoring system with the tally votes was partly um, designed to maybe break up some of the some of the clusters and hasn't been successful. Um, do you think it's possible to design a voting system that could break up those clusters or make it more, I guess, fair, if that's the way you see it, if, if, if this clustering is, is um, sort of determined to be unfair? Um, I, yes. 
it probably would be possible if you didn't have the public voting and you just had a you know, an international group of jurors for each country that could I mean, that there is evidence of some similar correlation even among the juror votes so um i i suppose i look at it slightly differently in that i don't see them as being unfair um every country is in a cluster some clusters are stronger than others but you know we've got uh we've got countries that are well perhaps less so in our cluster but most of the rest of the countries have got clusters that are favorable to them um and i think part of the point of the scoring system is a it gives everybody a say um and b it's quite exciting and at the end of the day it's only a song competition sorry those of you who... <laughs> um and um i i, I yes i i can't say I, I feel strongly that it's a bad thing um you know it, it produces some interesting dynamics and some swings and roundabouts in both directions but um as adam pointed out earlier the the winning of eurovision and the hosting of the next competition has dotted all around the continent over the last few years so it's not an overwhelming effect right, do you have any more questions in the room yes Thank you very much for that fantastic presentation. Uh, just a question about uh, what what the clusters could be in the future. You mentioned how the map uh, reflects political history and musical history. Where some countries might be changing their regime or changing their sort of political direction, do you reckon there is space for the clusters to change over time? Some countries maybe switch cluster, or they they might they might find a new friend in Europe. Do you think that's possible? Uh, definitely. I mean, we saw that last year with Ukraine. Um, you know, every uh, one of the things I say in my in my article on insignificance, which nobody seems to have received yet this month, um, is that last year it looked as if every public, almost every public around Europe, treated Ukraine as a neighbouring country. So you can get very short term things happening like that. Um, otherwise, I think I mean, the point about the political history was that it's it, it's a sort of long term thing that you know there's the cold war and there's yugoslavia and there's all sorts of other things that you could point to that do create trading barriers cultural barriers linguistic you know they contribute to linguistic path barriers and over the very long term these things will change but um in the short term i don't think they do um and it, it's only things like wars and, and other sort of major effects like that um the other thing that, that might erode them i think is that music is becoming more homogeneous in some ways in that um, uh, some of the traditionalness about East European music or um, Irish music or whatever is, is being adopted by all sorts of people all over the place and it's sort of borrowed and uh, changed around so it, it's becoming less easy to attach nationalities to musical styles so I think some of those things will will change as we just, just as, as music develops naturally over the next few, few years. Okay, uh, yeah, and I'll go to one question there. Thank you. Yes, you're quite right, but the voting, the, the, the televote reveal produces some dramatic changes. But isn't it spoiled a little bit, in my view, I wonder what your view is, you don't have to be a statistician to know how many points are left. And yet we see a split screen with Sam Ryder and Kalusha Orchestra. We know that he's not going to have enough points, but it's been strung out for about 15 minutes. It's, it spoils it a little bit for me. Am I being cynical or is, is, do, do you feel that way as well? I mean, I can remember um, the 69 contest watch. That was the first one I ever watched. I was very young. And, and that was obviously very exciting until the end. And it's not quite the same magic for me. Yes, I, I think different countries do it differently and what, how you build up the suspense and I, I think the trick is to do it quickly enough so that most people can't get their calculators out and work out um, and in most years to be fair it's not been quite that clear cut there that there's been a, a chance um, up to the last two or three of, of somebody um, sneaking over the line at the last minute but um, I agree it's a it's a balance that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't but uh, it's only the last 10 minutes that gets a bit dull once you've worked it out yourself Okay, I think we're just about at time there. So uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Andrew and all of our speakers once again.
And also, yeah, thank you for thank you for coming to join us today at the RSS Merseyside Local Group, um, whether you've joined here in person in the room or online. Uh, and I hope you have a very enjoyable Eurovision season. And we'll see you for our next event in June. Take care.